on the, uh, the blurb on the website, it said this is a light-hearted talk. Right? It's not really meant to be that serious. I'm, I'm primarily trying to have a little bit of fun with this. So just bear that in mind as, you, as we work through these slides. So what is data science? Jobs for mathematicians. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> All right. I, I can imagine it used to go something like this. Um, girl to boy, oh, hi. What do you do? I'm a mathematician. Then there'd be a little disappointed pause. And they'd ask, oh, do you teach? <laughs> All right. whereas, whereas now, I think it might be a case of this. Oh, hi, what do you do? I'm a data scientist. Ooh, sexy. <laughs> it's like, when did that happen? Right? So, so I, I thought, every, everywhere I looked, data science was sexy, and I thought, what the heck? So I did some research, and I went and I asked the Google, and I said, what's the story here? And I found this, and it says, I keep saying, the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians. All right, this was 2009. I don't think the term data scientist even existed back then. Maybe not. Maybe it was just coming into vogue. People think I am joking, but who would have guessed that computer engineers would have been the sexy job in the 90s? Hang on, I was around in the 90s. <laughs> I don't remember. All right. Anyways, but look, data scientist, the sexiest job on the planet. <laughs> is data, no, forget about the grammar, is data science the sexiest job of the century? Data science, the sexiest job of the 21st century. Data science, the sexiest job of the 21st century. Good Lord, it never stops. The sexiest job of the 21st century. Data scientists are sexy. They have their own hashtag. Sexy data, data scientists. I mean, good Lord, what's going on? Audience survey. Now, hands up if you class yourself as a data scientist. Come on, there must be at least, they're not all next door. <laughs> there must be some. Yeah, well, they're doing it for real. Um, God, I can't ask this question because my next question was to keep your hands up if you thought your job title attracted you to the opposite sex, whatever the opposite sex is for you. And I was hoping that all the hands would drop. But there's no data scientists in the room because you just all want to be data scientists, but you don't want to have to put the work in because you want to bluff it. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did a search on Google Images for sexy data scientist. <laughs> There's what came up. <laughs> uh, he, he sort of looks more like a serial killer to me, but anyways. <laughs> uh, okay, go on. And actually, um, that's true. He's about the fourth image along when you do it on Google Image. I'm not lying. I would never, I would never bluff about that. Um, all, here's what a real data scientist looks like. This is a guy called... Joel Gross. Now, I don't know if Joel is sexy or not, but he really doesn't do himself any favors because this is the image he has of himself on his web page. <laughs> right? But he is a bona fide data scientist. Uh, he used to work for Google. I'm not sure if he still does, but he wrote this book, Data Science from Scratch, which is actually kind of nice because what it is, is a, it's a pretty, it's a, as Computing books go, it's relatively thin. It's about 200 pages long, so it's sort of more of a, a pamphlet-type size. I don't know if anybody, when I first looked at Python, I used Mark Lutz's book, Learning Python. Like, I, I, it was Python 1.4. It sort of gives you an idea of how long I've been doing this. Um, and it, it was about so thick. Now it's sort of like you need a forklift truck to, to, to carry it around with you. It's a huge, big thing. But this book is also nice. It's that size. It's nice and small. And what he does in it is he says, here's all the things that you, that you need to sort of know to be a data scientist. And here's how you code them in Python. And then he, at the end of each chapter, he says, and now that you understand this, here's all the references of all the other stuff you have to go and look at. And there's like mountains of it, right, to really understand it. But it is, it is a really good book. Um, Here's the little bit from the back cover, which I, I snipped out. So crash course in Python, okay, we're fine there. Uh, basics of linear algebra, statistics, and probability. Mm -hmm. um, collect, explore, clean, munge, and manipulate data. We can do that. 
dive into the fundamentals of machine learning, maybe a little bit shaky, starts talking about key nearest neighbors, naive beers, linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, neural networks, clustering. Holy Moses, this is all being kind of quite scary. Um, recommend our systems map reduce. And when you pull out some of the words that are in there that you may not understand or you may have heard, and you might think you know, and maybe you don't, and they're all sort of mathy and statistics -y and whatever else, this is sort of what you end up thinking. We're not in Kansas anymore. This is very different to what we're used to. Right? But the book is actually a good starting point. And it has, in my mind, one of the best opening lines of any computer book that I have ever read. And trust me, I have read a lot of them because one of the perks of being a lecturer is that all the book publishers try to get you to use their books in their classes. And they send them to you for free and say, please consider this for your course. And when I first started, I was such an idiot that I would actually read them all, no matter what it was. Because I felt, they've given it to me for free, at least I can do is read it. So I read a whole pile of stuff that wasn't totally relevant, but we get all this. So I, I know what is a good opening line in a computer book, and here's his. Data scientist has been called the next <laughs> sexiest job of the 21st century. Presumably by someone who has never visited a fire station. <laughs> right? So, so I thought, oh, I wonder. So I, I decided it was time to do some research. And I decided that I was going to do some Google image research. And it was a mistake. I typed in sexy fire people or whatever. And I got this. And when I showed this to my wife, she says, they're not real firemen. Don't you know real firemen have bigger hoses? <laughs> and they do. Right, so I've, I, have read, I have read the code of conduct. Okay, so I know what is and what isn't allowed here. Right? Um, so, and I have to be, I have to, everything has to be equal, and we have to be diverse, and we have to make sure we don't leave anybody else. So here are, here's some pictures of some sexy girl fire people. Okay, there's a few disappointed faces because, because they have got their tops on unlike the lads, but again, I have read the code of conduct. I don't want to leave anybody out. So here is some sort of grandparent fire people, um, some kitty fire people. Um, I, I, well, I, I, didn't cite, I didn't type in sexy fire kids because I would have been like, no. Cartoon fire people. There's a Lego fire man, fire person. And when they do arrive, and they take me, and they strap me to a table, and just before they insert the probes, the last thing I hear, the last thing I don't want to hear is the words, you didn't include us in your data science talk. So here is an alien fire person. <laughs> right, and if you think I'm making fun of fire people, fire, fire, firefighters, I'm not really. Um, I think what they do on a daily basis puts everything that we do to shame. And I think that's a classic photograph. Although your man sort of leaning down there could have cleaned his pants. They're absolutely pigging. Right? But anyways, so far people. Right, so back, back to that. That is a confused baby. <laughs> and he's confused because you're probably a wee bit confused yourselves. And you're saying, where is he going with this? My students know the answer to this next question. Is he making this up as he goes along? Sort of like a well, life philosophy. And the answer is yes, because this was the longest introduction ever to the Bluffer's Guide to Data Science by me, Paul Barry, lecturer in IT Carlo. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about. So can we, can we, here's the central question, can a practicing programmer bluff their way as a data scientist? That's what you've all come here to find out, correct? Yes. Right? Here's the really short answer. <laughs> All right, I'm really sorry. Uh, people aren't built, built and sort of charging for the door, so I'll keep going, right? Um, surely it can't be all that hard, can it? Don't call me Shirley. That's probably showing my age a wee bit, is it? That was from one of the first airplane movies. Or, oh, you do know it? Okay, you're good geeks. Right, so, 
So surely it can't be all that hard. Uh, well, if you think it's not hard, you're sort of looking at it through rose-colored glasses, right? So you've got to listen to the Spock. Don't, it's highly illogical to sort of think that because you're a Python programmer, because data science is absolutely hopping mad with Python people and really, getting, really going gung-ho with Python, Python people, it's wrong to think that that's all you really need to know. There's a lot more to it, right? Um, that's... That's what we see when we hear the words data science. We hear a big mass of data and a little tiny science, right? Because we're trying to trick ourselves into thinking that this isn't as hard as we think it might be. That's sort of what we really should be seeing, a really small data and a really big science. Um, it's sort of, sort of the idea of the iceberg. What you can see is the bit that you think is there, but all the rest that sort of substance is underneath. And the bit that's underneath the water here is the science bit. Okay, people are beginning to look sad. Right? So the data bit is easy. The science bit is hard. Okay? At least this is my, my sort of take on it. Right? So the data bit is easy. So there is some data. It's actually taken from a talk that Dave Beasley gave at Pi Data Chicago in August. He has an absolutely fabulous... Um, they have a, a YouTube video of it, and it's him talking, but it's just showing you his screen. And it's brilliant. It's on YouTube. It's about 40 minutes long. And what he does, he takes this data, which is CS, CSV data, and it's the food inspections data for Chicago, and he brings it in and he mangles it using just things like the stuff that's in the collections module and dictionaries and lists and counters and default dicks and all that sort of stuff. And it's a fabulous, fabulous talk. And we know how to do it. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. There's a tiny bit of code that takes that data in, throws away the first line, because you don't want that from your CSV anyway, and then just reads in everything else. And we can do that. That bit is easy. Same thing goes for XML data. I don't know how much of it's out there. Uh, if you go and look at the data science sets out on the wild, a lot of them are sort of saying, here's the data as CSV. Very few of them say, here's the data as XML. This is the restaurant rating data from the north of Ireland. Um, which they have published a lot of data sets. I like them because they're smaller, because there's a smaller population, so you can play with them a little bit more. And this is XML, so we can process this in Python because we know about element tree. And here is the code which processes that data and tells you the restaurants that you should avoid, uh, the ones that have a rating of one. And again, that's pretty straightforward too. We can do that. We can pull in the information, we can parse it, then we can find the things that we want and we can do things about it. That's pretty straightforward. Somebody gives us JSON, Jesus, we're positively orgasmic because we love JSON data, right? I mean, JSON data is even easier to process because we have the inbuilt JSON module and we can pull it in, pull something out of it and spit it back out again. And once we get, it's, once we get the JSON into our Python, it behaves like a Python data structure and we can do what we want. That's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty, pretty easy, right? And then there's all that talking to SQL. Right? And there's a chunk of code which takes the data from the CSV file that we looked at initially, pulls it in, and puts it into MySQL database. And the only thing that it has to do is it has to convert the date format that's in the CSV file into one that MySQL uses, and it does it in a couple of seconds. And it's pretty straightforward. And looking at that code, I know what you are all thinking. You're all thinking, what is that import DBCM thing? Right? That's what you're all thinking. No, I Shameless self-promotion is about to occur because that is a bit of that, which is my book, um, which yesterday I announced. Um, it published, or it went to the printers on Friday. Next week, it turns out it's going to appear as an e-book, and in about 15 days, it'll appear as a, a, a dead tree version. Um, and I talk about DBCM in that. There is Santa logging into Amazon right now and ordering you all a copy, maybe? Um, if you want a discount code, talk to me after, right? Data is easy. The science bit is where it gets hard. Now, so let's talk a little bit about the science bit. So that, how many people look at that and sort of break into a cold sweat? Come on, be honest. Oh, you are all just... Yeah, see, there's a few... I mean, I put my hand up. Okay, any of it, any of it, not all of it, any of it, right? So you look at it and you go, ugh. I mean, like, look at this stuff here. What's going on here? Right? I mean, ugh. 
yikes. I went into programming to get away from mathematics. Um, now, data scientists look at that and they get a warm, come over all warm and fuzzy, because this is the stuff they love. We look at it and we go, what the heck is going on? That is sort of scary, right? Even the lingo gets confusing, right? Model. Okay, here's what we might think of as a model. A little airplane. <laughs> a girl. Something like that. Or if you're a Django person, maybe something like that. Here's what the data science people think of as a model. Sweet Jesus. I mean, I'm not even going to try and say what that is, because I just don't know. I'm going to guess it's the probability of something, but that's about as far as I... Oh, that's a probability. <laughs> yeah, that's just about as far as I can get, right? Um, and they have feature detection, right? I sat in a, one of them yesterday, and I sort of understand what was going on. Feature detection, right? Don't be put off by the smile. Or do be put off by the smile, is what I meant to say. All right? So they have this, this lingo. And you might, you might think, I was actually hoping I was going to have a few data science people in here. I was about to make fun of them. But anyways, um, the lingo, the math, the science, how wonderful and smart they actually are, you might actually think that they've all developed a wee bit of an attitude. Right? I, just, I just don't think that's true. Right? Um, <laughs> And when I saw this, I mean, just thought, I wonder, yeah, yeah, Romans, whatever happened to the Romans? I'm going to start rambling a wee bit, but it's my talk. I can do whatever the hell I want. It's Sunday afternoon. PyCon's nearly finished, right? So just, just go with me. Go with the flow. I am making this up as I go along. And I went and did some research. So I talked to, talked to Google, and they came back, and they said, in 476 CE, whenever that was, um, Romulus, the last of the Roman emperors in the West, which made me think was the Roman emperors in the East, or in the North, or in the South, but in the West, was overthrown by the Germanic leader Odoacer. That's what happened to the Romans. This is where I need to call on somebody with a German accent to help me with this next bit. So, <laughs> Harold very kindly volunteered before the talk. So come on up, you can, this is your microphone here. I was hoping to read. Well, you're going to read from here. Oh, like karaoke. Yeah, right? So <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, so just, I, I'll, I'll tell you when I want you to speak, okay? Because I, <laughs> I never do, had that. <laughs> I, can, I can do a pretty good northern accent, but I'm pretty awful at the German accent, okay? So the Germans are what happened to Romans. You know what they say about the Germans, whatever you do, Whatever you do, don't mention the global financial crisis. <laughs> Next one's you. Will you stop talking about the global financial crisis? Achtung! Me? You started it! We did not start it. Yes, you did. You loaned all that money to Greece. Sorry for destroying anybody's memories of faulty towers. Thank you. Give oh. Harold the chairs. Thank you. Ah, money. If only we had more of it. All right? Which brings us to pandas. You've probably all heard about pandas. All right? Now, I know that was a bit of an aside. This next one's even worse. It's totally irrelevant. Right? But it's a little interlude just to break the talk up a little bit. And this is because I have people in front of me, I have to ask you what is it about, what is it with red pandas? Anybody know, like, red pandas, any time I've gone to a zoo, right, um, there's always something like this written on the little card or written on the, the documentation, and it says, due to their shy and secretive nature, their large and largely nocturnal habits, observation of red pandas is difficult. And the first time we went to, to, to a zoo which had a red panda it was actually Belfast Zoo with, with my kids. I think the eldest fellow was about eight, so this is going back a long while. And my dad had us all keyed up, and he said, listen, granddad was taking us, and he said, listen, you may not see these red pandas. So I was telling the kids, listen, you may not see them. They're really shy. They only come out at night. It's a lovely sunny day. Don't get many of them in the north, but it was. And... Uh, we were there about five seconds, and my eight-year-old went, look, Daddy, there's one. Right? And it was there. And every time I've gone to a zoo with anybody, 
that have got red pandas, it says that on it, and then they always come out and say hello. In fact, I was in, I, it was kind of, it's kind of embarrassing, we were in Cork last summer, just my wife and I, and she wanted to go to, what is it, Photo Wildlife Park? We were the only people there without kids walking around the place. That was okay. My wife's big into animals, so she was training me around, and they had red pandas. And I swear to God, the little red panda came out, and I could have sworn he shook his little furry butt at me. <laughs> right? it's, like, it's like all the red pandas in the world in captivity are waiting for me to appear in their zoo. And I was like, come on, let's mess with his mind. He thinks we're not going to make an appearance. And what they do is they come running out, and they do that. Right? I mean, what is it with red pandas? Has anybody else experienced this, or am I the only one? Yes. So these things were supposed to be shy, really hard to see, are just screwed with us all. Damn those red pandas. Or just with you. Or just with me. Potentially just with me. But, so let's get back to the other pandas, which is the pandas that we hear a lot about in the data science world. Okay? And what is pandas? Well, it's the gateway drug to Python for many a financial analyst, right? I mean, this is the thing that financial analysts are using, and they end up using Python because they want to get at pandas, okay? But, and the question is, well, if I learn pandas, is that going to make me a data scientist? And I don't, I don't think it does. Here's what it says. I'm going to, this is a quote from another book, and it says, pandas is a newer package built on top of NumPy, provides an efficient implementation of a data frame. So again, there's the reference to data. Data frames are essentially multidimensional arrays with attached rows and column labels, and often with heterogeneous types and or missing data, as well as offering a convenient storage interface for labeled data, Pandas implements a number of powerful data operations familiar to users of both database frameworks and spreadsheet programs. It's all about data, not so much about the science with Pandas. Okay? But it does mention, it does mention NumPy. Aha, NumPy. Now, of course, if anybody remembers my lightning talk from last year, you know that I get worried and get all upset about how things are pronounced. And I've been listening to a lot of data science stuff, and this has been sort of catching my attention, because um, some people pronounce it in a funny way, and they, the question is, if I master NumPy, does that make me a data science? Um, surely, again, don't call me Shirley. Is it NumPy or NumP, as in Humpty Dumpty? Right? And people will say NumPy and NumP, and I'm going, what the heck is NumP? I think it's NumPy. It doesn't sound at all proper. But here's, here's what the book says about that. NumPy, short for numerical Python, provides an efficient interface to store and operate on dense data buffers. So again, it's a data technology, not a science technology, and Pandas is actually built on top of this. Now, it is huge in the, science, the, the, the data science and in the regular Python science world, um, SkyPy and all those other things all work on top of this, but it is primar primarily a data technology. Um, a great book is this. I, I think it's possibly mis misnamed. I'd say it's more of a a uh, marketing thing on O'Reilly's perspective, the Python Data Science Handbook. And what this does is it, it has about five or six chapters, and it's available as an early release. It's also available, I believe, as a bunch of Jupyter Notebooks in open source. You can go and get them, download the chapter as a Jupyter Notebook, and then go through it. Um, and it it's coming out, I think, in January as a, as a real book version. Um, I can't remember who Jake works for, but he had a really good, if anybody listens to Talk Python to me, the podcast, does anybody listen to Talk Python to me podcast? Um, he was recently profiled on Talk Python to me, it was really great, it's good, it was a good, a good, a good use of, of 50 minutes, if you get a chance. Um, and his book covers, in excruciating detail, IPython, NumPy, and Pandas, before he then spends two chapters looking at, I think, um, various machine learning technologies and other bits and pieces, but it's primarily like the, the first, the, the two-thirds of it are, are to do with actually processing data as opposed to actually doing the science work. So again, I think the emphasis is a little bit off. I may be being a little bit on, on further because he's not actually got it published yet, but it is very, very good material. The other big question is, what about R? 
right? You can't go to, to anybody to talk to anybody about data science without them talking about R, like we need another language to learn, right? R is the language of data parrots. Prepare to groan here. Arrgh. Sorry, that's a really bad, my daughter calls that a dad joke, right? Which is probably true, right? Um, R is like a stats REPL. That's how I would describe R to people. It's, it's primarily an interactive tool that you sort of play around with your data, and it has got fabulous visualizations built into it. It is very, very good at what it does. Um, it is not general purpose. That's, I think that's what Python has over it, is that Python is general purpose. You can do a whole pile of things in Python that you can't do in, that you can do in R, um, but there are a whole bunch of things in Python that you can't do in R. I mean, you can't build a web application in R, right? But you can build one in Python. I mean, that's, it's, it's a different type of technology. Um, there's what it sort of looks like. I mean, it's not a whole heap different to Python. Um, and this is an example. In fact, that's a, a, it's, if you were to run that example for real, it actually, that's a, a live sort of um, GIF down there, which changes as this code runs. Um, and you can sort of experiment and play with this in R. And it's actually very, very powerful. But a lot of this stuff is making an appearance in the Python world, primarily driven by the, ex the adoption of Pandas. Because Pandas has positioned itself as the Python library, which does all the stuff that R does and pulls in all these other bits and pieces. So, so Pandas is sort of where the, where the action is. Although I, think, I don't think R will ever disappear. Um, I think it's reasonable to state that Python may one day replace R from a data science point of view, but R will never ever replace Python. It's just a different type of technology. Um, and it probably doesn't hurt to know both, right? Doesn't, a working understanding of R cannot hurt. Um, this is a book that I, if you really want to get into data science, this is the book I would recommend you look at, right? The fact that these are all O'Reilly books, it's not like I work for them, okay? They're publishing my book, but I, I, that's as far as it goes. This is just what I think is the best book. And um, these are two um, mathematicians, statisticians out of the States. Um, Kathy O'Neill, the second author here, has just published a book. I think it's called um, Weapons of Math Destruction. And it's to do, I haven't, I, I'm planning to read it, I haven't read it yet. And it's to do with how people are using statistics and big data for bad things as opposed to good things. It's sort of all to do with ethics, ethics and everything else. I'd imagine that everybody next door is going to read it because it's getting excellent reviews. This is a very good book. It uses R almost exclusively. And what it does is it's a whole series of, essentially what they did was in, I think, 2013, 2014, I can't remember where it, which it might have been Columbia, it was one of the, the universities in the States, they brought in a bunch of guest lecturers over like a 12 or 13 week period to their data science class and they turned each of the chapters into, or each of the lectures into a chapter in the book. And they asked the people to not only sort of describe what they were doing, describe the algorithms, describe the maths, but also provide R, which allowed them to actually then sort of take what they were talking about and actually apply it, right? I read it, and at the end of it, I said to myself, I'm going to have to read it about four or five times more, right? It's not the kind of book that you read once and set down. It's the kind of book that you study, right? But it talks about all of the stuff that you need to actually understand the math and understand the science. And that's where the, that's where the difficulty lies, right? There's a whole pile of other tools. There's TensorFlow, there's SkyPy, there's SkyKitLearn, there's all the machine language type stuff. Um, what has a picture of a cow got to do with all this? Well, I tell you, you can use all the tools until the cows come home, but you actually have to know what you're doing. You have to understand what is the math behind this? What is the model? How do I create the model? How do I do all my fitting to all of my graphs and all the scatter plots and everything else which I've been talking about all weekend next door? And that's where it gets hard. If you don't know what you're at, being a master of the tools is no use to you, right? And in fact, if you are in an organization and you're thinking of getting into data science, I think the easiest way to do that is not to take your Python programmer and try and turn them into a data scientist. I think the easiest way to do it is to hire a mathematician, absolutely. Just bring in somebody with the expertise and hook them up with your Python programmer and let them have at it. Right? Absolutely. I think that's the way to do it. So it's data science. 
not data science, right? The emphasis is on the word science. That's what we want to do. And if you can remember that, I think you're going to be OK. And that is the Bluffer's Guide to Data Science. Any questions or comments? Is he, is he here? Is David in here? Is David in here? Did he go out? Damn it, I finished on time. I'm even early. He gave out to me for being late yesterday. Told me he was going to get me a watch, and the guy was waving frantically that my time was up, and I was just ignoring him. Um, so we've got, we've got a bit of time. Anybody, any comments or questions? Anything at all? You didn't mention Julia. Didn't mention Julia. Who's she? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. I mean, I, I'm actually, I tell you, we're actually running, the reason I'm getting into this sort of big time is that we're running an MSC in Carlo at the moment. Um, it's two 12-week semesters followed by a 16-week thesis. And the students are on campus three days a week, so Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, for 12 weeks before Christmas, 12 weeks after Christmas, and then they have their semester. And I'm actually taking the module, surprise, surprise, Python for Data Scientists is my module. So I'm, I'm doing all of this stuff, and I'm just really just covering the Python stuff and the tools. They have another module where they're doing all the stats and all the mathematics, and they have another database module. And then after Christmas, they have like an infrastructure module where they're doing Hadoop and all that sort of stuff. Um, they're doing visualizations after Christmas and insights, and then all the algorithms, all the data science algorithms and analytical stuff. That's all coming after Christmas. So we're doing the foundation stuff, they're doing the other stuff. And one of the guys in, in, who was on the course day one, I said, we're going to use Python. He puts his hand up like immediately. And he says, why aren't we using Scala? And that was the last question I expected to be asked. And I, and I felt like saying, because we're using fucking Python, that's why. I was, you know, wanted to say it to him, but I couldn't. So I then had to explain it to him. Now we've been, let's see, if we're on to week six, I think. So we're halfway through. And he can't imagine using anything but Python for the stuff that we're doing. Right? I think Julia, yes, is another language that people are using in this space. But I think the traction is all behind Python. I mean, it's just going gangbusters. Just have a look at some of the books that are coming out of all the publishers. They're all talking about data science. They're all talking about Python. Right? You get the odd one about something else. But they tend to be very specific. Any other questions? Harold. Wow. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> thank, thank God you came in. <laughs> and what, what, what do you mean by the... Is it exponential or existential or whatever? One, two, one, two. So yep. the question for the audience again was how can we help humanity people to better grasp grasp as in understand, feel, uh, be able to deal with exponential developments, exponential things. So because <coughs> I've been sitting in some of the data science talks and there have been a lot of regressions and classifications and there were always straight lines and straight and linear regression is so cool and, and you have TensorFlow disgress linearly and whatever, but the dangerous developments are the Exponential ones, compound interest, yeah. um, the roses on the uh, pond and something, and we are very bad at detecting it. Decades ago, I had uh, tax attorneys telling us great investment stuff, and they put up something that was clearly an exponential curve, mm. but they only had except, uh, explanations for linear things. And you can always put a tangent even on an exponential curve. And they did this and explained what this linear thing means. So, Yeah, I, I, when he first asked it, I thought it was, were you talking about humans? He was actually talking about humanity students, right? Humanity, people who study humanities. He's right, all the graphs that I looked at yesterday and today and next door, they all went like that, every one of them. I think the reason is that it's still early days. I think what we're seeing is a lot of low-hanging fruit sort of being picked off initially at this stage. The stuff that's relatively easy to do and relatively straightforward, that's what they're doing. And there's lots of it. I mean, there's lots of data out there that people just aren't doing anything with. And I think there's lots of value in that. And there's lots of relatively easy things that you can do to get value out of it. 
I mean, even that little tiny script that I had which told me which restaurants to avoid in the North of Ireland. I mean, you don't have to be a data scientist to do that, right? But I, I don't know. I think if we can, like, with our course, um, we are insisting that the people are already programmers because it's very hard to bring them into that environment and not have seen code before, not know what a loop is, not know what an if statement is. Now, um, we have a couple of people who have got R and they're struggling with Python because it's a different beast. Um, and we have other people who have years of Java experience and they're, they want to use Scala, that sort of thing. So, I mean, we haven't really got anybody who's not from a technical background coming in. It'd be interesting to see what, what sort of course we could put together for people who have the humanities background, maybe social scientists or whatever else, that are maybe pulling stuff out of SPSS and all that sort of thing, doing regular stats and saying, well, how do we combine that with, with what we think is data science and Python programmers and all that sort of stuff. Right, so I, I think it's, it's too early to really answer that. It's a great question. I don't have an answer. And I think the answer will come, I think. Does that? Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Okay. One more. God, if it's anything like the last one. <laughs> <sighs> David will just hit them a smack and say, ask a proper question. Is there any way that we can bring sexiness back to computer science and computer engineering? <laughs> Well, I tell you, I, I've always thought it was sexy, but I, I don't know if you remember the, uh, well, maybe, he's, maybe, maybe you've seen it. I can remember going to see it in the cinema with Ro Robert Redford. It was called Sneakers, I think it was, was it? Sneakers? And I can remember taking my, who eventually became my wife, but we were dating at the time and we went to it and she thought it was a great movie. And at the end of it, she turned to me and said, that was brilliant. And I said, yeah, I know, I know, yeah, computers. And she says, why can't the stuff you do be like that? <laughs> Now she married me anyway, so maybe I am sexy, but who knows, all right? I don't know, all right? One. <laughs> one last one. <clears throat> um, so we can see here that the uh, scientists already develop uh, quite, a few, uh, you know, a large number of uh, libraries and tools uh, to help dealing with uh, data. So. Aren't we witnessing emergence of uh, data engineering? Yeah, data engineering, I think, is... For me, data engineering is more to do with getting the data to the point where you can give it to a mathematician and they can then tell you something about it. Right, so you've got... Like, if you look at that CSV data, I mean, the data comes in, it's got all different types of date formats, it's got all types of different addresses, it's got all types of different, you know, some lowercase, some uppercase, um, and you have to take the data and clean it all up and munge it and get it ready to feed into some model, which will then tell you something about it. And I think all of that up until you, where you hit the model, I would class that as data engineering. That's what I would call data engineering. And I think we have a lot of that sort of licked. I mean, you could probably all be data engineers tomorrow, because you've got all the Python chops, right? But it's the next bit, the science bit, that I think is, is, is difficult. But as I say, hire a, hire a mathematician, hire somebody who has that expertise, and just use them, you know? Put them in, uh, combine them with your team. Hmm? Throw them away in your with them. I can remember one of my ex-bosses used to say, that, well, you programmers, you just throw them in a room, chuck in a bit of raw meat, and they'll be fine. <laughs> So the, the talk last night, one of the lightning talks last night, brought them back to me when they were talking about what it's like to lead teams.